Well, thank you and welcome to my webinar on photographing birds and wildlife. I'm Paul Nguyen, professional photographer and photography instructor. I'm uh, residing in the Boston area and I make a full-time career out of nature, landscape, and wildlife photography. And I also teach photography through my uh, photo workshop business and photo tour business, Blue Hour Photo Ventures. What I'm going to teach you today is how you can, with relatively simple equipment, make striking captures of birds and wildlife. This is a talk that's uh, based on one of the live presentations I've done to camera clubs, like the Boston Camera Club, uh, specifically on bird photography. And I've adapted it for you today to include not only birds and wildlife, but also to kind of inc incorporate this idea of doing this without breaking your back and without breaking your bank account, right? Because uh, you know, we all know that these guys can go out there with these huge lenses and, you know, giant tripods and make great captures of birds and wildlife, but how can you do it without spending the same amount of money on these huge pieces of equipment and without, you know, dedicating an entire suitcase just to this giant lens, right? Well, the good news is that I make all these wildlife captures, or at least most of them, without having bought that giant lens, right? Whenever I need it, I have a way to get it without buying it, and most of the time I'm using equipment that does fit into my own backpack, and it doesn't cost me a fortune either. So that's what today's uh, presentation is going to focus on. It's kind of like uh, wildlife and bird photography that can be accessible to uh, an enthusiast or at least a serious amateur photographer, or at least one that has intention of becoming a serious photographer without making that investment that would say, oh, well, you know, I better turn pro or else this is going to be a big waste of money, <laughs> right? So the focus of this presentation is um, on those things. And before we start, I'd like to say, you know, even though there's a focus on bird photography here, I am not a birder, so please don't call me a birder. I consider birders to be those people who get in my way at all the locations where the birds are and stand there and say, oh, look, it's an it's an a woodcock. It's amazing. Uh, and block my view, or they come equipped with their life lists and they check things off and then go home, right? <laughs> I'm really not about, um, you know, acquiring things on lists. So I, I have this quote, I'd rather make a great photo of a chicken than a boring photo of, you know, insert bird here, <laughs> right? Because it really is about making a great photograph, not about checking things off of your list, whether you're a birder or a mammal person, right? We're here because we're photographers. We want to make great pictures of whatever subject. And sometimes mundane subjects can make great photos if you know what you're doing and you're there for the right moment, right? So uh, this presentation will focus on a few key points which I'll go over before we start. And the idea uh, first is how big a lens you really need, right? You always see that guy with <laughs> the huge lens. Um, or do, can we really just go basic, go lean and mean? And lean and mean is a concept we've created that just says, um, you know, we want to be mobile, we want to carry stuff that's relatively portable, we want to be able to um, not spend uh, our entire life savings on the idea of acquiring bird and wildlife photography. I'll also go over equipment, so what camera and lenses you can use. And the good news is all the cameras and lenses that I use are, you know, a lot of my students have them too. They can be accessible to everybody. Uh, whether you want to, want to use a flash, a flash extender, uh, when to use a tripod and when not to use a tripod, what settings you would put on your camera, like aperture, uh, what shutter speed, what ISO setting, and what autofocus mode you would use to photograph wildlife and birds. I'll touch on composition or how to arrange the elements in your photograph, and that includes positioning of your subjects, positioning of the background relative to the subject, uh, how to crop your images for maximum impact. I'll focus on one very specific area of bird and wildlife photography that happens to be different from all the rest, which is photographing hummingbirds. And then I'll touch on the ecology and biology aspect, which is researching your subjects, knowing how to put yourself in a position to make an excellent capture by understanding your subject's biology, natural history, and tendencies. Before I was a photographer, I was a biologist, and my degree in college was actually on ecology and biology. So photography is not, uh, you know, is not my main training. My main training is on how to understand my natural subjects, and I would argue that that's gone a lot further for me, or it's gone, gone a lot further for me than a degree in photography would. 
And then the last link is how to find places to see birds uh, and wildlife. So to address the issue of how big a lens do I really need, I would say don't be this guy unless absolutely necessary, right? And this uh, this is kind of a, a parody of myself because this is a lens that I once uh, rented for a sp very specific bird shoot that I did in Nebraska. Uh, that brings me to my next point. Why own a lens this big when you can rent one, right? So a lens this big, um, this happens to be a 500 millimeter f4 prime lens, prime meaning it doesn't zoom. And this lens, when you buy it new, will cost you $12,000, you know, $10,000 if you want to buy uh, the older model, right? And you know, you want to take good pictures of birds, but why would you buy this lens, right? Why would you spend $12,000 to take pictures of birds if you're not especially sure that you're going to be serious about it? Um, I'm pretty serious about wildlife photography, and I don't even own this lens, right? Why own it when you can rent it for a very specific shoot that you would need? So you don't want to own a lens this big for most people because it really is a liability. A lens this big limits your mobility. It's so big that you need a huge tripod to take it everywhere you go, and that takes time to set it up. So every time you put it down, you spread the legs of the tripod out, you position the lens, you get everything in place, that takes like five minutes. In that time, if you happen to see a bird, it's probably gone in that time, right? So it's a mobility liability. It's also a monetary liability, right? Because it costs so much money, and then you have to worry about it. You're like, oh, what if I drop it? What if I damage it? How do I travel with something this size, right? Um, and when you, people see you with a lens this big, they'll always ask you, because they think you know everything, right? They'll ask you about the mating season of the boreal chickadee, because clearly you must be the person who knows, because you're carrying the huge lens, right? So equipment this big is a liability in so many different ways that we really want to avoid being this guy. I was this guy for only about a week of my time when I rented this for a shoot in uh, Nebraska, like I said. And uh, there's a time and a place where you want to have equipment like this. It's definitely not all the time. It's definitely not for your everyday photography, right? If you were an everyday wildlife and landscape photographer and you went out and you went into a blind every single day, um, maybe it would be worth it for you. But for most of us, including me, it really isn't. So. You use this, a kind of, this kind of equipment, like I said, when you're going to be in a stationary situation for several hours of, at a time, or when there's absolutely no chance that anything else interesting uh, would happen that would require you switching lenses. So in other words, once you've connected your camera to this lens and this tripod setup, you're in it, right? You're in it, you're in it for the day. <laughs> so it's an investment of your time for the entire day when you uh, get yourself in this kind of situation. So. Um, to go over some of the situations where I have used a lens like this and rented it, of course, that would be when I'm photographing birds like this. This is taken from a blind in the Platte River, um, on the Platte River in Nebraska. These birds need to be photographed from a blind because they're so skittish and afraid of people that the instant they see you in the morning, they're not going to be there for much longer. They'll be spooked and they'll fly away and you, you know, you'll be that person responsible for ruining the entire shoot for every birder and every photographer there. So you would duck into a blind early in the morning and you'd set up your equipment in there. And then by the time the sun starts to come up, you'll be all set up and you'll be photographing these birds, these sandhill cranes, for the next several hours. So in this particular shoot, I used my old Canon 7D with the 500 millimeter f4 lens at f9 for 1 1,000th of a second at ISO 500. This is a situation where, um, you know, the settings are typical, the equipment is not. So uh, moving on again, these are the sandhill cranes that I photographed from the blind. And basically this is the only situation, uh, like I said, where I photographed using a, a lens of this size. Mostly though, in my work, I'm going lean and mean. I weigh the benefits of having the lens of that size versus just the mobility of having something smaller, right? So a lens that's that big is 500 millimeter, 600 millimeter, whereas the lens that I could carry around with me and possibly use without a tripod, without you know getting all rubber armed at the end of the day because the thing weighs 12 pounds, um, would be 400 millimeter, a much lighter lens that weighs you know three and a half pounds. I can put it on my camera 
and walk around with it. I can put it on a tripod, and it zooms. It can zoom from 100 to 400. It's a more versatile piece of equipment, and that's something I'll go into uh, more in a little bit. So you go lean and mean when size and weight are a consideration. And for me, most of the time, they are a consideration, right? I'm not somebody who's photographing from a fixed position a lot. Uh, wildlife for me can be a very opportunistic thing. Maybe I'll hike into an area to photograph landscapes and I'll see wildlife along the way. Or I'll be walking along a trail and I'll see a bunch of different animals that I want to photograph. I'll see different birds as I walk along the trail. And I don't want to have to set up the tripod and the gimbal mount every single time, right? So I always say the best pieces of gear are the ones you are likely to carry with you. So there are those guys out there who insist on having, you know, the f2.8, the enormous lens that you have to use on a tripod. But if you're going to be lazy about it and occasionally leave it at home, or you're only going to be using it from the side of the road or in a blind, uh, maybe it isn't the best piece of gear because you're not going to want to carry that with you when you have to hike, you know, two, three, four, five, six, or eight miles to get to where you're going. Or if you want to do something else with your day, like photograph some landscapes as well and carry other equipment with you. So maybe you want something that's a little bit more versatile. In this case, a smaller, lighter kit for wildlife that you can handhold when you need to means greater mobility and greater range of motion. And the bottom line of all this is that it leads to fewer missed opportunities, right, and fewer missed shots. So the key in all of photography, in my opinion, is having the gear that will actually encourage you to take more pictures and get more keepers. So the minimalist kit for me, and some people wouldn't call this minimal, but uh, as a serious photographer, you're going to have certain standards, uh, like going lean and mean. Uh, minimal usually means having a DSLR body that you can rely on. So in the past, I've used the 5D Mark III or the 7D. I've used uh, most frequently in my portable kit, the 100 to 400 millimeter zoom lens. And then you can attach a, onto that a 1.4 teleconverter, which basically is a small lens that goes behind your other lens, and it multiplies your focal length by a factor of 1.4. So it gives you yet more reach on your uh, already very versatile zoom lens. Optional, you can use a shoe-mounted flash, uh, basically a flash that just attaches to the top of your camera. And you can use that for additional illumination of your subject or at a very simple level just to add a little bit of light in the eyes of your subject, right? We call those catch lights. So when you take a portrait of a person, it's kind of nice. It adds a little extra dimension to their eyes when there's a little uh, glimmer or a little glint of flash in their eyes. Uh, the same goes for wildlife. If the eyes just look like two black holes, it can be very kind of lifeless sometimes. Um, but if you add a little bit of a glimmer using an optional flash, it can add life to your subject. And then even more optional is a flash extender that you add to your flash to extend the reach of your subject. But to go truly minimal, what you would need is a zoom lens, either a 100 to 400, or some people use a 75 to 300, and a DSLR camera. The issue of a tripod or a no tripod is something that you'll also have to weigh. There are benefits and liabilities to both. So if you use a tripod, and I always bring one. I don't bring a huge tripod because I don't use a, an enormous lens. But with a tripod, you get more stability, uh, less fatigue throughout the day, throughout your shoot. But it's more cumbersome to set up. And of course, it reduces your mobility, right? Every time you have to pick up and move around, if you have to close up a tripod, then that takes a lot more time and it's a lot heavier and it may impede your ability to climb to certain locations or to reach uh, certain locations. So you might want to go without a tripod then. Without a tripod, you have freedom. You can shoot at any angle, at any height, very quickly. While another person is moving the tripod around or lowering the height of the column, you could simply just get down on your knees or crouch down, or you can move to the left, move to the right. You are very quick and mobile. But it gets shaky and tiring with big lenses to shoot throughout the day. And there are certain lenses that you simply can't use without a tripod. So when I don't have a tripod and I'm using the 100 to 400, that's about the limit of where I'm willing to, to go. So that's about the limit of the, the size that I'm willing to carry in a lens. Like I wouldn't use that enormous 500 millimeter uh, without a tripod. It just gets very tiring very quickly. So the goal then is 
doing more with less, seeing how many great pictures you can take without a ton of heavy, expensive equipment. Most of the shots that I make and sell routinely of wildlife are made with exactly the uh, equipment I told you, uh, handheld, as a matter of fact. So this was taken with my Canon 5D Mark III. You can buy this camera. Uh, anyone can buy it. And I use the 100 to 400 lens that's been around for a long time. Um, you know, I use an older model that's been replaced already. And I attach the teleconverter, which allows my 400 to go out to as far as 560 millimeters. And I use F8, 1 640th of a second, and a relatively high ISO. I'll go over all these uh, specific settings and how you arrive at these settings in a bit. But these shots here will just show you what you can do with the, the same setup that I use pretty much uh, throughout my career. This is done with a 7D, again, handheld. I took this from the surface of a boat where you can't really set up a tripod and you're just forced to kind of uh, rely on your own um, body as a tripod, you might say. So uh, adapting a very stable stance, learning a uh, you know, good, steady hand-holding technique, which simply comes with practice. And again, a shot taken uh, also with a handheld setup. Um, on this shoot, I ran into a bunch of other photographers who were using, using very heavy lenses on tripods, but this owl, uh, this owl was flying so close um, that you really didn't need a tripod, um, to, and you really didn't need a very long lens to, to, to photograph this owl. So I was able to do a lot with very little uh, relative to the other photographers. So let's get into some of the settings that are kind of integral to photographing wildlife uh, and birds. So there are a number of parameters that you can adjust on uh, most DSLR cameras. You have the option on your DSLR to shoot single, meaning uh, every time you press the button it takes one shot, or you can shoot continuously, meaning if you hold the button down it continues to take pictures. On some cameras you have the option of a low speed continuous or a high speed continuous, whereas on most entry level DSLRs there's only one continuous setting. In either case, for shooting wildlife you always want that continuous mode. If you have a more advanced camera you would go for high speed continuous versus low speed. But if you have only a one option, then certainly set it to continuous, meaning as long as you're holding the button down, it's going to continue to take pictures, which increases the probability that you'll get a keeper, that you'll get a winner among your shots. Because animals, of course, are moving all the time. Um, and, of course, they blink, just like people do, right? So if you take one shot of a person, they might be blinking. If you take one shot of, uh, of an animal, they might be blinking, they might be moving, they might be in a strange-looking position. So you always want to take that, uh, take those shots with a continuous setting, so you can maximize your chance, uh, your chances of getting a keeper. For your focus settings, um, if you have the option of changing your autofocus point, you should set it to the center autofocus point, or at least a center cluster of autofocus points. The reason for that is the center autofocus point is usually the fastest and most accurate autofocus point. And it's also the most predictable, right? If you set it to be um, any autofocus point in the screen, then the camera doesn't always know what you want to focus on. By setting it to one predetermined point, you basically tell your camera, this is where I want you to acquire focus. So this makes it very easy for the camera to acquire focus quickly when you tell it specifically where you want that focus to be acquired. When you are working with a stationary subject, you can choose to uh, set your autofocus mode to one shot or single. Um, on Canon cameras, they call it AF one shot, and in Nikon cameras, they call it autofocus single. And by stationary, I don't necessarily mean that the animal has to be completely still. I just mean that it's not moving around within the scene. So it can be in one place moving around, and I, I would still you know, put that into the category of a stationary subject. And that means that every time you're, uh, if you're in autofocus one shot or single, once you uh, have pressed the shutter button and you focus on the subject, it stays locked in on that setting, that focus setting. Meaning, um, if, your, if your subject is going to be in that place for some time, you know, a few seconds at a time, it's going to be still enough for you to use this one shot setting. However, for birds in flight, um, you want to use the servo mode. On Canon, it's called AI servo autofocus, and on Nikons, it's called autofocus continuous. 
And that means that as the subject is moving throughout the frame or back and forth in the frame, the camera is going to continue to change its focus as long as you're half pressing the shutter button. So you see the difference here. For one, the, the stationary setting, the one-shot setting, once you focus, the focus stays locked until you complete the pressing of the shutter button and take the, the picture. Whereas if the, subject, if the subject is moving continuously throughout the scene, back and forth, left and right, then as you're acquiring focus on the subject, you're half pressing, and then the camera will continue to change the focus as long as the subject is moving, and it's going to continue to acquire focus dynamically um, until you finally make the capture. So if you have any questions on that, I'd be happy to uh, delve into that towards uh, the end of the presentation. But basically there are two settings here. There's one shot um, or single, and there's servo or continuous. And the one that you choose will depend on whether your subject is basically staying at the same place. It can be moving, but staying in one place and moving, right? Or if it's moving around the scene, whether it's moving back and forth um, throughout the scene or left and right through the scene. So there are a few ways to set your exposure. Uh, the exposure meaning, you know, shutter speed, aperture, ISO. The, I'm going to go over a couple different options that I use. Um, this option one is the one that I use most frequently. Now, even though the subject is moving, a lot of people will, will tell you that when the subject is moving quickly, you should use shutter priority mode, but you really don't have to. I actually find myself using aperture priority mode for nearly all of the shoots that I do, regardless of whether it's landscapes or wildlife. So in aperture priority mode, you set the, um, the aperture and the camera chooses the shutter speed for you. The idea behind this is that for wildlife, um, even fast-moving wildlife, there's no one shutter speed that you want that works. It's actually a range of shutter speeds that you, you want. You want your shutter speed to be fast enough, right? You don't necessarily want one one-thousandth of a second or one sixteen-hundredth of a second. Maybe you would actually more accurately say you want your shutter speed to be at least one one-thousandth of a second. So if that's your, your case, and that generally is the case for most of the shots that I take, then I would sh set my shutter speed to somewhere between 5.6 and f11. Typically, I prefer to use f8 for wildlife. It seems to be a magic number that we, works most of the time. Then I set my ISO, which is the sensitivity of my camera. I set that manually for the ambient conditions so that when the resulting shutter speed is calculated by the camera, it turns out to be at least one one thousandth of a second, or I should say one one thousandth of a second or greater. So the ISO that you would set would depend on how bright the situation is, right? Um, ISO 400 is typically what I would use if it's relatively bright out. If I'm taking the landscape, I would use ISO 100 because nothing's really moving in a landscape. But when I'm shooting wildlife, which tends to be moving, I want to make sure that my shutter speed is much faster than it would be for a landscape shot. So if it's very bright out, I would use ISO 400. If it's getting a little bit dimmer or overcast, I would use ISO 800, or I would use ISO 1000. And then if it's getting even dimmer, or I want to make sure I even have more speed, then I would use ISO even higher, 1600. The idea with ISO is you want to use as low a setting as you can and still have a fast enough shutter speed. Low ISO ensures that you'll have the highest picture quality because the higher you bump your ISO, the pictures start to get noisier and noisier, uh, which kind of looks like grain in your pictures. With modern digital cameras, ISO is very well um, controlled in the sense that the higher you go, with the better cameras these days, you can hardly tell the difference between a low ISO and a slightly higher ISO. So it used to be that with the earlier digital cameras, uh, ISO 400 was starting to look pretty bad, but now ISO 400 looks so good that I have no problem using ISO 400 and getting uh, very clean images. So for wildlife, to recap, I generally start at ISO 400 and then bump it up as necessary in order to get a shutter speed that's one thousandth of a second, uh, one one thousandth of a second or greater. The next option is to set your camera to manual mode. In manual mode, you set the f-stop and the aperture, right? In the first setting, in the aperture priority mode, you would set aperture and the camera calculates shutter speed for you, but here you set both. Um, in this scenario, option two, I would set my f-stop to somewhere between 5.6 to 11, 
I set my shutter speed to one one thousandth of a second or greater, and then I put the ISO to auto. So I let the camera choose the ISO for me. So to recap, you set the aperture, you set the shutter speed, and then you set the ISO to auto so that the camera can choose the ISO for you. So in this scenario, you basically been, you know, are, are more specific with your shutter speed setting. So let's just say I'm to set my f-stop to f8, I could sh set my shutter speed to, if, if I know my subject is moving very quickly, I could set it to 1 1600th of a second, and then on, depending on the ambient light, the camera chooses the ISO. In option three, um, the one I use the least, I actually use, would use shutter uh, priority mode. So I set the shutter speed to ISO, uh, sorry, I set the shutter speed to 1 1,000th of a second or greater. So here for this uh, horseshoe crab shot where I want to absolutely freeze the splashes of the water so that they're crystal clear, I could set 1 1,600th of a second. Then I could set the ISO manually for the ambient conditions that I have. Where if it's very bright, um, I could set ISO 400. So in this Horseshoe crab photo here, um, you know, it's obviously a very sunny day. It looks very bright and sunny on the beach. So I could set it to ISO 400. And then the resulting f-stop would be between 5.6 and 11. So you have a couple of options to use here. Um, like I said before, the option I use most frequently is simply to set the aperture myself, uh, set the ISO myself, and then let the camera choose a shutter speed. And then I make sure that they, the shutter speed is fast enough for the situation that I need. So it's not like there's a shutter speed that it absolutely has to be. It just has to be fast enough. And then if I take the shot and I find that the shutter speed isn't fast enough to freeze the motion of the animal that I'm trying to capture, then I'll raise the ISO a little bit more. Or I will open up the aperture a little bit. So I'd like to go over a situation here that's a little bit different from the other wildlife and bird photography that you'll do. It's the hummingbird conundrum. The thing about hummingbirds is that everybody wants to photograph them because they're very interesting subjects, but they're very difficult to photograph and most people will approach it the wrong way. Most people try to photograph hummingbirds by following them around and trying to move the camera and anticipate where they're going to be and focus on them with autofocus and take their pictures that way and that never works and if you've ever tried it you'll find that it doesn't work because hummingbirds simply move around so fast that your camera cannot acquire focus on them and they're so small that you're going to miss them every time with autofocus so you're screwing up on a bunch of different fronts right you can't focus on them the autofocus is off maybe the shutter speed just isn't fast enough and in the end of the day you're very lucky if you can even get a picture where the hummingbird is in the frame, uh, chances are it won't be in sharp focus if you do it that way. So I'm going to tell you how this um, is different, how this method is different from how you would photograph uh, normal birds and wildlife. Uh, the different approach that you're going to adapt requires spending some time without a camera, just observing. So the th first thing you'll do is, um, in the morning, observe. Spend some time watching the flight patterns of the hummingbirds and watch for where they visit regularly. Look for the flowers where you see them um, partaking in the nectar. You know, they'll have a little circuit of flowers within the same yard or the same uh, lawn. And they'll go around and there'll be some flowers that they always go to. Then you set up your camera and point towards that flower, one of the flowers where you see them uh, regularly visiting. This ideally will be a flower that is uh, accessible to you, meaning it's not too high, not too low, and it's close enough. You put your camera on a tripod and you pick one flower and you establish focus on that flower. And then you switch your focus to manual. So hummingbird photography is best done with manual focus. If you try to auto focus, um, that always takes time. It takes time for the camera to acquire focus, even if you've set your camera up to face one very specific area. So if you know the bird is going to come here, or rather you hope that the bird is going to come to this one particular flower, you just focus on that flower ahead of time and you switch your focus to manual. And then you don't have to worry about focus anymore. The beautiful thing about not worrying about autofocus is the instant you press the button, uh, the shutter button, the picture will be taken, right? There's no time that you have to wait for the camera to acquire focus ahead of time. 
Hummingbirds usually are in and out. They arrive very quickly, they sip, and they're gone within a second. So any time that you can save is uh, time well spent. So the time now um, is just to establish your exposure settings. You've established focus, now you establish exposure. So you would do that using one of the settings I uh, told you before. You could uh, establish ISO for the day, um, the, the daylight conditions, whether it's very bright, you establish ISO 400. If it's very dim, um, you can establish a higher ISO. You establish your exposure parameters, um, F8 if you'd like. And the idea with hummingbirds is they're even faster than norm other birds you photograph, so you want to start your ISO even higher. So probably ISO 800, ISO 1000 would be where you would want to start even on a very bright day. Be patient and when the bird approaches uh, the flower that you focused on, act fast and take many shots using that continuous, um, that continuous shooting mode. The moment only lasts a second or two at the most, so stick around and repeat this over and over again and you, feel, you just get absolutely exhausted of this. Chances are the first time the bird comes, you won't get a good shot. Right? You'll miss the moment or it'll be a little bit blurry, maybe the shutter speed's a little bit too slow. So you'll probably be repeating this until you get exhausted. It's beneficial when you're photographing hummingbirds to use a flash. Um, this, is, this is where it gets a little bit trickier. Flash duration is very fast. It's much faster than most of the shutter speeds on your lens. And you want to set your camera up so that the flash becomes your only source of illumination. This becomes like shooting um, in the dark um, when you have to use a flash and the flash is the only thing that's lighting your subject. So in this case, what you would do is you would manually set your f-stop to a higher number just so that you have more depth of field in your shot. You can set your ISO to a relatively low number so that the ambient exposure is dark before you use the flash. And then you turn on your flash and you set it bright enough so that it becomes the sole source of illumination in your picture. So in this case, you don't have to rely on sunlight at all. You just use your flash to take the picture of the bird. This is a little bit trickier scenario, so if anybody has questions on that specifically, you can ask it at the end of the webinar, or you can email me uh, or contact me um, otherwise to uh, ask me these questions. So this is the rig that I use for photographing the hummingbirds. Um, I'll briefly go over what happens here. I'm facing my camera towards one of these hibiscus flowers, and this is this hummingbird is photographed in of uh, Vieques, Puerto Rico, so that's the, the lovely scenery that you see in the background. You take the flash off the camera and you trigger it with a wireless setup. You place the flash closer to the flower where the hummingbird is going to be. This buys you a little bit extra illumination as well. And you trigger it with, like I said, a wireless, uh, wireless radio transmitter. The reason why you don't keep the, cam the flash on the camera is that there's an additional distance between the flash and the flower. So you really just want to move that flash as close as you can to the flower so that gets you more illumination, more light. It also softens the light and uh, while it increases the flash's intensity. This also buys you the opportunity to place your flash at an angle because flash um, that's placed directly on the camera is very harsh, it's very direct. We all know this because we've taken pictures of the point and shoot where the little flash uh, fires and everybody looks like you know the deer caught in headlights. It's a very unflattering look for people, and it's also a very unflattering look for wildlife. So you'll see in this setup here, what I've done is I've placed the camera on a tripod, I've faced the lens towards the flower, I've taken the flash off camera and I put it over here, um, over on this corner off to the side, which makes the light softer because it's closer to the subject, um, makes the intensity of it higher because it's closer to the subject, but it also makes the light look a little bit more natural because it's off to an angle. What you see on top of my camera here is a wireless transmitter that allows me to fire the flash um, from a distance. And I've also improvised. I've used a coconut <laughs> to weight down the flash bracket here. Since I don't, didn't have another tripod that would work on this wall, all I do is I, uh, you know, use the local ingredients, you might say. And in Vieques, Puerto Rico, one of the local ingredients is a coconut. So I put the coconut down and it's what allows me to weight the flash and keep the top heavy flash from falling over. 
So uh, that was the setup for hummingbird photography. Now we'll go into a little bit more of the artistic concept of wildlife photography. How do you go from just you know mundane pictures of animals to wildlife and bird photographs? Here you see a straight up par portrait of a puffin. It's okay, you know, it's a puffin. You know it's a puffin, you know you've seen a puffin. But how do you go from this to a more interesting capture like this, right? Natural interaction appeals to human emotion. The first picture was cool. I mean, it's a nice picture of a puffin, but this one makes you go, aw, they're courting, they're mating, they're in love, or wh whatever we want to say about these two puffins. This reminds us of ourselves, right? It has a kind of interactive, emotional component to it that makes this photograph so much more interesting than the first one. And if any of you have ever entered, you know, wildlife photography contests, they never like to see just a pretty picture of an animal. They like to see natural behaviors. They like to see interaction. They like to see intrigue. They like to see emotion. So this is, this is the kind of thing that will take your wild animal photograph to the next level. Stick around, take more shots, look for interesting opportunities to capture human emotion in bird form or wildlife form, right? Animal behavior reminds us of ourselves. These bison are butting heads, and who can't relate to that, right? Whether it's your brother, your sister, your spouse, your business partner, animal behavior reminds us of ourselves, and this is why the tugging on the heartstrings makes for a much stronger photograph. We look for in animals things that remind us of who we are, right? Your photograph tells your subject's story. This osprey is a breadwinner. It brings home the bacon in the form of fish to its wife, his wife, who then feeds the, the nestlings, right, the little baby ospreys who have hatched. And the most interesting thing about the dynamic interaction between these ospreys is that, in many ways, they're a lot like people in this regard. When the male osprey comes home empty-handed, the female os osprey actually kicks him out of the nest and makes him go out again until he brings back something. So throughout the day, the male will come back with a fish, in which case he can land in the nest, and when he comes back empty-handed, the wife kicks him back out, says, oh no, you're not landing here until you bring home the bacon. So the photograph tells a subject story that is very often akin to our own story. Let's talk a little bit about composition then. How do we arrange the elements of the photograph so that they are appealing? Well, one way is to look for interesting groupings. You look for groupings of three. Uh, there's something about the magic number three. Uh, two is okay, three is better, and four seems to be too much. So you look for interesting groupings of animals. Uh, most wildlife photos will have lots of extra space around the subject, so feel free to crop in to make for a tighter and more interesting uh, photograph with less wasted space. When you take pictures of wildlife, the reason why we have so much room around them usually is because, well, one, they're usually far away, and two, we want to leave ourselves a little margin of error to crop. Because we've used the center autofocus point, usually when you take a picture of wildlife, the thing in the middle is going to be the sharpest, right, because that's what you focused on. But then the principles of photography usually state that the thing in the very middle should not be the most important thing. We usually put the most important thing slightly off-center because it makes for a picture that's a little bit more intriguing. It allows you to look around the entire picture because it creates uh, some form of negative space for you to look into. It lets you go from areas of blurriness to areas of sharpness. Um, uh, and that's what they call the rule of thirds. You place the main subject off-center according to the rule of thirds and looking into the frame so that the viewer, when they look at your photo, will actually scan the entire, subject, uh, the entire photograph. Because when you put the most important thing in the middle, you tend to look directly at it and then you don't look at any of the other things in your photograph. The main subject should be tack sharp and your secondary subjects can be slightly blurred. And this is how you create kind of an emphasis between um, main subject and secondary subject. On composition, sometimes the photograph can be more important than the bird or the wildlife itself, right? Because here I created a three-part composition using the rule of thirds, uh, and birds are part of the image, 
but they're, you know, this could be anything. It could be water, it could be trees. It just, in this case, happens to be birds. And the birds, um, the flock of them here, makes for a very interesting composition because it's a part of something. It's not just birds, it's a layer, it's a concept, it's a whole area of your photograph. And now uh, let's talk about the native aspect of your ratio uh, of your camera, the aspect ratio of your camera versus maybe the ideal aspect ratio of your photograph. Your camera um, automatically shoots pictures in the three to two ratio. This is what we call the native ratio. The three to two ratio tends to be very long and landscapey looking. It seems, seems to be better for landscapes than it does for portraits and for much, uh, much wildlife. Um, but in, under certain situations, it can be useful. Uh, the native 3 to 2 is, uh, like I said, a landscape format, which is useful for emphasizing how wide something is. Uh, when you're photographing birds, it can be useful for emphasizing the breadth of a bird's wingspan in shots where the bird fills the whole frame, uh, much like it does here. If I were to crop this photo any differently, any squarer, you would lose some of uh, the width of the bird. You would lose some of the, the wingspan of the bird, or at the very least, the bird would start to look very cramped when it's spreading its wings out. So it works for this situation. However, it may be too much negative space for other compositions, which I'm about to show you. In this one, I've taken the, uh, the 3 to 2 ratio and I've cropped it. I chopped one end of it off so that it's now a 5 to 4 ratio, which is kind of a more classical uh, medium format portrait camera ratio. The reason why I do this is because it minimizes the wasted space in the photograph. Here, you have all the negative space that you need, really. If you look at this elk, he's bugling, he's doing something interesting, he's showing the natural behavior, so in every way it's a, a strong wildlife photograph. He's looking into the frame, just like he should be for a strong composition, and the rest of this is just negative space. If I were to show you the native ratio in which I took this picture, it would be just a lot more space on the right, and that space would just have more grass in it. I would consider that to be extraneous. Um, in photography, oftentimes it's nice to just minimize everything. You don't always have to show everything that's there, and in this case, it's nice enough to just simply um, imply that there's more negative space there without actually showing it. So in this one, you've shown everything that you've needed uh, without the full native aspect ratio of your camera. So in this case, just chop it off, right? Show them a shorter image. Uh, this photo here of this turn carrying a fish shows you the same idea. You don't have to show all the negative space. You can make a square image that still gets the entire point across. The turn is carrying a fish flying into space, into the ocean. And you can show that the ocean is there right here on the left without showing the entire image of what was around. Right. So nice, uh, nice and tidy. We've cropped the image. We've reduced the aspect ratio to 5 to 4 instead of 3 to 2. And in that, we've minimized the wasted space, which is often the right decision for wildlife photography, because wildlife photography is essentially a portrait of wildlife. Right. Just as we take portrait images in the um, vertical uh, format here, we do the same with wildlife. And one thing you've noticed, uh, may have noticed, when you take a picture in the upright, in the vertical uh, position with your DSLR camera, is that in the native format, vertical pictures look too tall and narrow. So in this case, you'd also want to crop. You'd crop this to the four-fifths or the five-fourths crop, similar, similar to taking a human portrait with an old portrait camera, which was natively four-fifths. This is what I would use for birds that stand tall and animals that stand tall, and it works better. It works better simply because it looks more balanced when you crop it this way than if you leave it in the you know, landscape format turned vertically, which just looks too tall and narrow in my taste. So what do you need to know about birds and wildlife in general? Uh, we're veering dangerously into birder territory here, and the reason why I limit this slide to just birds is that um, I talk a lot about migration in this, uh, this particular slide, and most North American mammals don't really migrate, if you notice. Like, uh, they tend to stay in their home range, and when it gets cold, they just sort of hunker down for the winter. Sometimes they hibernate. 
um, uh, African wildlife migrates a lot. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you'll see caribou, Arctic wildlife migrating a lot, but most of the North American temperate wildlife stays right where it is. It's the birds that migrate. So here I ask, where will your birds be? Do they migrate? And if they do, where do they stop on their migration? Uh, what habitats do they prefer? Uh, what are they eating when they get there? These are some of the things that you would like to know before you take pictures of your wildlife, particularly birds, because they're the ones that will be moving around throughout the continent more. Uh, and this is the biologist in me talking, right? When certain aspects of their life cycles are happening is another thing you'll want to know. When are they mating? When are they laying eggs or when are they birthing if they're mammals? And if they're birds, when are they fledging? Meaning, when are the feathers growing in? When do the babies start to fly? These are the things that you'll research ahead of time. For instance, the uh, sandhill cranes that I showed you at the be beginning of the presentation, they do migrate. They go from Mexico to Canada. Um, they do this in the spring. One of the stops is the Platte River in central Nebraska. And of course, if that's one of the places where they stop, there's going to be thousands of them there. And it just so happens that there were hundreds of thousands of them there. The habitat that they prefer in this particular case is uh, middle of the river because they're able to stand there and then predators can't get to them. What are they eating when they're there? They're eating all the corn in Nebraska that was harvested the year before and is um, you know, left behind in the meadows. So it's the kind of scrap corn that farmers left behind and that's what they're eating. These are the things that you know ahead of time and it will help you to plan your shoot. If you're photographing puffins, you'll have to know that they only come to land for about two and a half months out of the year, between May and August. They come to the islands off the coast of Maine, um, or Alaska, or Iceland, or Scotland, and they're there specifically to mate, to lay one egg, to see that egg hatch, and then that one hatchling fletches, fledges and then goes out to sea with them uh, by August. So if you were looking for puffins and you showed up in September, you'd be too late, right? They'd be out at sea already. So those are simply the things that you will want to arm yourself with before you go out on your wildlife shoot. How do I find out all this information? Well, you can go to your trusty Audubon field guides. You can go to your birding and wildlife websites. Um, these owls that you've seen in this uh, presentation here, I researched them on Canadian and uh, Quebec uh, birding websites, and that's how I knew that I had to go to this one particular place in Quebec to find them. And then the last solution is to ask a birder so that you don't seem like one. Thanks very much for tuning in to my webinar. Um, if you have any questions about what I talked about here, you may contact me specifically through the information that my uh, host, Paul Gravelin, will provide you with at the end of the webinar, or if you've registered for the webinar, you will be sent a link to watch the webinar and also how to contact me. If you're interested in the work that I do, um, I teach photography workshops both locally and in various destinations around the country and the world through my business, BlueHourPhotoVentures.com, which I run with two other photographers. Um, we run workshops, like I said, to places like Cape Cod, uh, local to me here in New England, uh, Acadia National Park, which is going out this weekend but is already full. Uh, we run workshops to the West Coast. We do Oregon, we do Washington, we do workshops in the South, and very soon we'll be doing workshops internationally as well. We'll be going to Iceland in April, and we're also planning trips to the Canadian Rockies and New Zealand for next winter. If you're interested in uh, seeing more of my work, please go to my fine art photography website, paulnwinphoto.com. Thanks very much for your attendance today.